One little known fact is Dr. Stair, in his youth, was a phenomenal beach basketball player. You added the adjective. The phenomenal or the yeah, youth? No, the phenomenal. Okay, yeah, all right. Okay, he went to University of Tennessee, Knoxville, medical school, University of Tennessee, Memphis, and now internal medicine at UAB. If you remember from his presentation previously, he nearly died. And as you can see, he is fully recovered. Yes. Right. Please join with me in welcoming oh, the man so. who gave up an Olympian <laughs> beach volleyball career to be a doctor and to come and speak to us today on the title, Wisdom in Today's Cruel Culture, Dr. Stephen Thank Stanley. you, Russ, yeah. very much. <laughs> We had this dream beach volleyball court outside our medical school uh, condos, and it was awesome. So we played every day. Loved it. Haven't played in 20 years, though. Can you all see that the Millers are online on Skype? Pretty cool. Okay, I'll talk louder. Thank you. Um, I thought you guys might want to see this picture. <clears throat> I, have a, I have a place in my heart for John Hill and Chance Hallmark, who are here alone with their children for two weeks while their wives went to Rwanda, and they made it, I believe, yesterday, and they are very excited to be there. So here's Lavinia, and here's Cheryl, and they survived the 24-hour plane flight. So uh, please pray for my friends who have to cook dinner every night and have to figure out how to get the kids off to, to school in the morning. So uh, I'm always really honored to be able to talk to this class. Um, I don't really belong in front of you, uh, but whenever I'm asked to do a presentation, I do a lot of them at work at UAB, I probably do 100, 150 presentations a year, mostly to physicians, providers about compliance, thanks to my friend Steve Brannon back in the back who recruited me about seven or eight years ago, and then he left, thanks a lot. But I always look at two things, is do I have a, a passion for what I'm talking about, and can I teach them something that they don't know? And so, you know, the second one today is pretty tough. So I've added a third one. What can I learn from this group for the subject that we're going to be, be talking about? And I really love this song, and I want us just to read the words again, because this song I don't think is for our children. I think it's for the people who are teaching our children. How shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from sin? They don't know how to do that. That's up to us. Thy word, the choicest rules imparts to keep the conscience clean. Tis like the sun, a heavenly light that guides us all the day, and through the dangers of the night, a lamp to lead our way. Thy word is everlasting truth, how pure is every page. That holy book shall guide our youth and well support our age. It's amazing they sang that song this morning. I mean, can you imagine the coincidence? Anyway. <laughs> And, you know, I have, have a couple of other passions. I've been teaching with my wife. We taught the four-year-olds for about seven years back in the nursery, and we're teaching the, the lads to leaders right now, the third through sixth graders. And it's such an amazing group of kids. And uh, they're engaged. They're, they're so uh, innocent and willing to learn. And we're talking about Proverbs now. So that's kind of been on, on my heart for a while. So what I wanted to talk about today was what some of these kids are facing in our culture today. And there are enough of you here that have kids and grandkids to where this, I think, will matter to you. I hope so. And I'll also have a, an, a, another caveat is I don't know any of this stuff, and I'm not very good at any of it. So let me just tell you, you know, I, I need your help too. Um, just as an aside, does anybody know what Jack Clark went as for Halloween? A ceiling fan. <laughs> Go ceilings. That's the Jay and Vanya Clark humor. It, ta it takes a few seconds, right, Vanya? <laughs> so these are the kids that are here, that you see every day, that we are teaching, that Shannon and her group is doing such an amazing job with. And uh, I like to put pictures with thoughts and, and ideas. Um, this just made it in there, too. I don't know why. <laughs> this is a bunch of creeps that came to Trunk or Treat last, last week. So if you watch Duck Dynasty, you'll know what this is. So just let me go through some statistics. So Russ, start furiously writing for your wind-up, okay, at the end. 
What are our kids facing? And this, some of this is pretty brutal, and some of it is kind of scary. Within the past year, 75% of high school students have had one or more drinks each day for several days in a row, and 28% of high school students drank alcohol before age 13. This is probably not your child, but it's the, it's the children that your kids are going to school with. 8% of high school students have used cocaine in various forms. 12.1% of high school students have used inhalants one or more times. I asked my daughter if she knew what an inhalant was. She said, yes, I do. So they know. She's 14. 47% of students, 47% will be sexually active before high school ends. Things are a lot different in our middle schools and high schools now than they were even 20 years ago. One in five Americans over age 12 test positive for herpes. 41% of girls, 41% of girls ages 14 to 17 experience unwanted sex primarily for fear of their boyfriends getting angry with them. There's so much pressure. Two thirds of the 15 to 18 million cases of STD, sexually transmitted diseases, occur in kids under the age of 25. 35.5, sorry, I'm gonna get rid of this. We have lots of Skype friends. 35.5% of all high school girls have had sad, hopeless feelings for longer than two weeks, meeting the definition of, of depression. We use a screening test. We talked about that actually at my last talk of how we screen for depression. In two weeks of sad, hopeless feelings, meets criteria for significant depression. 12.4% of African American females, 18.6% of Caucasian females, and 21% of Hispanic females have made suicide plans in the last year. 11.5% of females in high school attempted suicide last year. Not just thought about it, attempted. How about media? Oh, this hits at the heart. The average child between 8 and 18 spends the equivalent of a full-time job plus overtime engaged with media. There are over 300,000 pornographic websites on the internet. Kids spend more than three hours a day watching TV. And if they have a TV in their room, it goes up to four and a half hours a day. And you guys remember when, you know, I watched a lot of TV when I was young. It's amazing how much I watched when I think about all the stuff that I know. But, you know, when you think about the shows that were kind of are in our, our past and our, our childhood for us was the Cosby Show and, you know, Family Ties and uh, some of the Andy Griffith Show. And I've seen every Andy Griffith Show probably ten times. Like, right, right. If you, I just went to the websites for CBS and ABC last week and you know I'm seeing violence and sex and immoral it's really hard to find a, a Cosby show or a, a show that you would even feel comfortable sitting down with your children and watching you know at night I will promote Duck Dynasty though it's pretty clean <laughs> okay this is um, this is another network and you just go show to show to show and I'll guarantee if you sit down and watch one of these shows for 10 minutes, you will be shocked. And, um, you know, we, we, have, we have friends, adult friends, who have some of these shows as their kind of guilty pleasure, you know, where they, where they watch them. And it's, it's, it's tough. Would you sit down and watch a show with your child? I think that's a pretty good barometer. What about bullying? <clears throat> this is a huge initiative right now in all of our schools. But you, it's very difficult to stop. One-third of middle school students responded yes when asked whether they are bullied because of their clothes. That was in the Midwest. These are nice families. This is not New York City or L.A. This was in the Midwest. Over 160,000 children stay home from school every day for fear of intimidation. That's directly from the National Education Association. Boys bully differently than girls. Uh, Boys like to physically bully, girls like to mentally and emotionally bully. And I'd be willing to bet that <clears throat> things like this, if they happen to you in your childhood, you never forget them. I know I've, I've had a couple things that, that you never forget. Your, your mind is so impressionable at that age. And of course, you've read the stories 
about internet bullying and Facebook bullying where the children commit suicide because of, because of bullying. What about eating disorders? This isn't something you might think about very often. 13% uh, of high school girls purge, throw up after they eat so they can keep their weight down. 30 to 40% of junior high girls worry about their weight. And the mortality for anorexia nervosa, 20%. Um, I've, I've mentioned last time that I, I have a patient with severe, severe anorexia nervosa who weighs, I think, 79 pounds. She's 60 years old. And, you know, these are deep emotional, emotional things that, that happen. It's hard to understand them, really. But the fact is, our culture, if you pick up any magazine, look at any commercial, you see what the American woman, you know, should, should look like you know, basically rail thin, bulimic looking with lots of plastic surgery. And so that, that's, that's what our girls' culture are seeing now. Now, I, I'm going to do a very quick biology lesson um, about, about puberty. This is the brain. This is the cerebral cortex. <clears throat> and these nice little things right here are basically the source of everybody that's ever had a teenager of your crisis management, okay? <laughs> At about age 11 or 12, the hypothalamus starts to kind of wake up and starts to send signals to the pituitary gland, which is the size of about a little baby aspirin in your brain. And it starts pushing out hormones like luteinizing hormone and FSH to stimulate the ovaries, the testes in a, in a male to produce lots and lots of hormones. For girls, of course, it's estrogen. And basically, their bodies and their brains are just bathed in, in estrogen for a pretty long time. Same with boys as well, with testosterone. And of course, those hormones control worry, anger, fear, crisis management, um, body uh, gaining weight, you know, body weight, hair, all the things that happen, of course, menstruation, those kind of things too. And so, you know, this is part of our creation. This is part of our makeup. And so, you know, and the other thing that you need to know too is the cerebral cortex is really not fully formed, especially in the frontal lobe, until about age 25. 25. So you're talking about all these things that we've talked about, all of these stresses and pressures and things in school that are happening at the same time as this is happening. And so you get Anybody who's had, you know, who's had a teenager knows what these two pictures mean. So you get a, a life at, at home of ups and downs and roller coasters and screaming and I hate you, Mom, I want to leave this house, I, want to, I never want to see you again, to, you know, everybody knows what, what I'm talking about. And so in the face of our culture, the, the question is, you know, where can we, what can we do? Where can we find, you know, find wisdom? And, this is supposed to be an encouraging words talk, right? So it hasn't started off that great so far. <laughs> Everybody depressed now? We added the percentage? Yeah. No kidding. Well, I want to read Proverbs 4, if you'll turn to Proverbs 4 with me. We're, like I said, in our Lads to Leaders class, with our third to sixth graders, who fortunately are not, not in this roller coaster yet, they're just incredibly fun. And the teenagers we have are really fun too. I don't want you to get, get a mistake. My, my two daughters are the most amazing <laughs> girls that I've really ever, ever seen. And so um, let me just share what we're talking about with them and then how some things that we can do. And this is where I need your help. Things that have worked for you. And, uh, and I'll, you know, we're going to make this open as much as we can for the time we have left. All right, Proverbs 4. Listen, my son, to a father's instructions. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. When I was a boy in my father's house, still tender, and an only child of my mother, he taught me and said, Lay hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. Esteem her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will set a garland of grace on your head and present you with a crown of splendor. 
Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way, for they cannot sleep till they do evil. They are robbed of slumber till they make someone fall. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet, and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Guard your heart. That is, um, if, if, if this chapter could just be embedded, you know, for our children, uh, w- what a different place this would be. And so, you know, we need, we need help. And we have, to go, we have to go to the Word and we have to come to each other for help. Because most of us can probably think of children, grandchildren, nieces or nephews who have, who have, lo- have been lost and who have, you know, who have, have not been able to, to travel this road. So wh- what can we do? Well... You know, we have to keep, keep our kids connected. If, if you'll do a mental checklist for me, and I'm talking maybe more about parents that are kind of my age, with our age kids first, but also a lot of you are very close with your grandchildren too. And if you think about the things that are competing for our attention right now that never existed even 20, 25 years ago. So start going. I just started making a list, okay? Email, instant messaging, texting and a cell phone. Why did we ever get them one? Oh my goodness. The internet, TV, Twitter, Facebook, Skype, computer games, Xbox and PlayStation, movies, iTunes and iPods, school activities, college football. Did anybody wake up their children last night at about 10.30? Sports, church activities. I mean... Yes, some of these things existed back when I was growing up and you were growing up, but my goodness, I mean, this has been, we would never even thought of these things 20, 25 years ago. And the fact is, a child's brain who is wired the way that we're talking about is just very susceptible to being sucked in by this stuff. And we see it. We, we already see it, you know. And so, you know, we, we've got to have some boundaries. And we, we're trying in our family. We're, we haven't gotten very good at it. You know, it's... It's just the way that kids kind of communicate with each other now. And what's scary about this is, you know, it's not actually conversation. It's electronically pushing buttons and being maybe somebody that you're not to somebody who's, who knows where they are. So, you know, there's just a different different mindset and culture for kids growing up now about how they communicate. You know, so what what can we do? You know, you've got to take time. Just the simple daily things. To, to take walks. Sometimes I have to grab my daughter and make her walk with me. You know, it takes a while, but after, after a while we, we do okay. Driving in the car. You know, this is a big one for us. Put away iPods and phones and texting and even, even books. Our daughters love books in the car while you're driving. It's a great time for conversation. Limit computer time. Be sure you have family nights and games and vacations and things where you can't help but be together and to connect. The simple things really can, can make a big, a big difference. Keep them in the Word. You know, I, I love that song that we sang, and it's so true. Um, I want to talk about a couple of things. Deuteronomy 6, 5. And I've got a, a lot of verses here, so I've kind of got them printed out. <clears throat> love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is, you know, one of our kind of famous epic verses, but what comes after it, I think, is even really even more important. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. 
Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You know, to me that doesn't mean making them do Bible study every day. That means incorporating spiritual things in everyday activities and events. It means bringing them to church. They, they can't be in the Word if they're not, if they're not here. And I, I don't have any doubt that my, the way that my parents had me at church every Sunday and Wednesday, that, that hearing the Word over and over and being with Christian people helps me. I can't tell you how many patients that come in devastated, crisis, miserable, and they haven't, you know, they, well, I stopped going to church two years ago. You know, there's just always a parallel, in my opinion, with that. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And when I think about exasperating, to me, that's, that's showing patience, <clears throat> having patience, understanding some of the things that they're going through and, and letting it ride. You know? This is a big one, and uh, this is really hard. Keep them away. Keep them away from garbage on TV, on the Internet. I'll get rid of this again. Titus 2, 11, 15 is um, a verse that I, I really hadn't, hadn't read very often. but found it. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Encourage and rebuke. That's really the, that's the challenge that I think we have as, as parents and grandparents is finding that, that balance, is building them up. These are great, great kids. It's just, it just, you know, a lump in my throat almost every day, thinking about, our, about my children and about the children that we teach here uh, with what incredible beings they are. Uh, but they, they need and they want direction. Philippians 3, 18, 20. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. That the verse 19, to me, perfectly describes what you see on TV, what you see in the world, the culture. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. And it is way too easy for us just to let, let our kids take it in. And it's almost impossible not, not to allow some of it to happen. Um, but the fact is they need, they, need to, they need to be in the world. They need to see what's there. And I strongly recommend also, from a parent and from a physician standpoint, talking very early to kids about sex and about alcohol and about drugs. I mean, start those conversations early. You want them asking you. You don't want them asking their friends. Things they're learning at school are not always based on, our, on foundations that we have. So talk to them early. Don't, don't be shy. And keep them away. You know, it's very difficult to watch a football game with the commercials. Everybody, you know, knows that. We're, we're, reaching, we're reaching for the pause button for the Viagra commercials at, at 11 o'clock in the morning, you know? And so it's, it's a challenge. Discipline. <clears throat> Discipline swiftly and consistently. And, you know, I, I don't think there's any doubt that our, our kids want and need discipline. Um, the kids that are in jail right now didn't have any. And this is not as easy as it sounds, as you guys know. We have, we have great girls, they've grown up, they're really good students, and, and they do a lot of things right. And so, you know, it's easy for us to get a little lax sometimes about that. 
but God you know, speaks very strongly about discipline all throughout the Bible. Um, I'll, I'll go to Hebrews 12, 7, verse 11 first, where he actually compares the discipline of a parent to his discipline for us. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our own good, in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. In Proverbs, I can't wait to get to these verses for our class. Proverbs talks about discipline probably about 18 or 19 different times. And I'm just going to real quickly, you know these, these verses, but let me just go through and just, just listen. It's too hard for you to try to, to flip to them. Discipline your children, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Proverbs 13, 24, Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Proverbs 23, 13, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Proverbs 29, 17, Discipline your children and they will give you peace. They will bring you the delight you desire. I love these, love these verses. And um, this is one of the, probably one of the hardest things, as you guys know, uh, about, about what we're doing as we raise our kids, is they push and push and push. And uh, this, is, this is pretty strong language from Proverbs, from Solomon. Do not be a willing party to their death. You don't discipline a child can lead to their death. Pretty strong, strong words. Okay, this is the last one. Um, there's actually some physiology in hugging. Uh, most women know what oxytocin is. It's the hormone that's produced to help with contractions and labor, but it also is produced with physical contact, oxytocin. So a 20-second hug produces increased oxytocin, um, the body, and that, that creates a bond with whoever the, whoever the person is, is hugging, actually. And so, you know, as, as kids get older and they start having relationships. You know, these are important things to think about. Hug your child as much as you can. They're being hugged by somebody else, you know, if it's not you. And certainly, you know, as they, as they start to think about the husband or wife that they want to marry, the, these are things that, that become uh, important to them as they've seen it in us growing up. I mean, we, we, want, our, we want our daughter to marry somebody who's me, you know, and... and <laughs> I know that sounds, sounds funny, but I want to be the example of somebody that she looks at a boy and says, okay, well, does he measure up? And, you know, some days I don't think I do a great job at that. Um, but, you know, we, we can't do it if we're not, if we're not there. So, you know, we, we need help. And parents of teenagers need a lot of help from those of you who have survived, survived these years and um, have you know, both good and bad made mistakes, because we all certainly will make mistakes. Um, but this, you know, these are my two. So this is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really fun and challenging time for, for parents. And, uh, you know, they, I, I really appreciate the, the bond that they have here with their friends, and, uh, and the fact that they have a bond with, with you all too. I know in our core group, you know, they've gotten to know a lot of, a lot of our, our folks in the core group. And um, we, um, we, just, we hope that when you see them, when they're, they're around, give them, give, them, give them a smile and be positive and give them a hug. And uh, it really means a lot to them. So you know, I think the biggest mistake that people make is they try to reason with them like they're adults. And they're, they're not. And they want to be so bad and they pretend to be. But we saw, you know... The, the changes, they have brain damage. They have, they have brain damage. 
and this is what I tell patients who are struggling, you know, with their teenagers. So you well, you know, they're brain damaged, right? So you've got you've got to take that into account, and uh, that's a mistake that, that I make sometimes too. Is they're supposed to respond exactly as I think they should, and that doesn't always happen.